Alright. So let's work through this. You guys have learned two sets of naming rules. You're going to apply them here. That's the whole purpose okay, of doing these at the beginning. Even after we do that practice sheet with those practice problems and we start on these naming rules again, we're still going to keep doing this every time you come in and be looking for it. <coughs> so up top, your cation is the key because you should be able to look at this and determine that this is a metal and that is a non-metal. Why? Based off the staircase off the periodic table. K, which is potassium, is on the left. F, which is fluorine, is on the right of the staircase, which means we have a metal and a non-metal, which means we have an ionic bond. Thus, having an ionic bond, we have to determine what set of naming rules we're going to use. Do we need to use, just based off the monatomics, name the cation, name the anion, we're good, or do we have to use the stock system? IDE. Both of them use IDE. Oh. So in this, look at the cation as the key. Where is the cation on the periodic table? It's column one. So it's an alkali metal. Is it one of the D block dudes? No. no, it has a fixed charge. You wanted the element quiz, right? I'm going to stick you over in Miss Morgan's room because I'm using the elements. Okay. So, it's not a D-block dude, therefore we don't have to use the stock system, so we're going to name it based off of the cation the anion. So the cation is named based off of the element, so potassium. Then, the anion is named based off the element, remove the ending, add the I IDE, so fluorine turns to fluoride, so potassium fluoride. I gave you that one as a little bit of a trick. I want you guys to get used to this. Don't get caught up in this snare. And I'm not being mean when I say this, but it, you know, in, in these math classes that you're taking and you go through, this is what you're used to doing. You learn to do something, and you do it for 30 times. And you just keep doing it. You're not really doing something because you're understanding that you need to do this process. This breaks that mold. You have to be able to look and determine which set of naming rules you're going to have to use. Like in this case. I have iron, which is a metal, and sulfur, that is a non-metal. So we have an ion bond. Look at the cation. The cation, in this case, is iron. Is iron in the D-block? Yes. Since iron is in the D-block, that means we have got to use the stock system. So we've got to find the charge on the iron. In this case, it will work for you if you reverse the cross. But I want to show you the other way of getting it. This is the surefire, 100%, always correct way you're going to end up with it. Look at the anion. Sulfur. Make sulfide. Sulfide comes from a 16th column, which means it has a negative 2 charge. Negative 2 times how many of those sulfurs are there? 3 gives you a negative 6. That's the charge of the anion. That means the cation has got to match that. So it's negative 6, so we got to have a positive 6. How many irons do we have? 2 divided by 2 gives me 3, so this is iron 3 sulfide. Any questions? Yeah. You want to know how I determined that? I didn't do off the math. I just, you know how you're supposed to like switch them? You did the reverse cross? Yeah. So you took this three back here, that two back there. I said iron three. Yeah. That's fine. The only thing is, is notice that sometimes it will not work. Like if they have same charges, 
like when we did that iron two oxide, iron has a plus two and oxygen has a minus two, so it's just FeO. Mm -hmm. Just be careful in those spots. We're gonna practice it like crazy, so. So when that happens, you don't put anything except if that. And the charge. Okay. We'll hit. Them. We'll hit. Them, I promise. Then we got carbon. CO and N. CO is cobalt. Is cobalt a D block dude? Yes. Yes. So we got to find its charge. Let's look at the anion nitride. Okay. Nitride. This is a perfect case. This is exactly what I was just talking about. Nitride has what cut? What charge on it? Negative three. Okay. There's only one nitride. There's only one cobalt. What's the charge in the cobalt? Three. Positive three. This is one of those cases where if you reverse the, the cross, it wouldn't work. Does that make sense? So cobalt, three, nitride. Because I looked at the anion nitride and I seen it has the negative three charge. So that means that the charge on the cobalt, since we have negative three, means that the cobalt has to have a plus three charge. And then I divide it by how many there is. So there's only one, so it leaves me with a plus plus three. Okay. Good question. That is a good question. Let's move over here. We now have the names and we're looking for the chemical formulas. Do the same process that we talked about doing before with taking those, uh, write down the ions and then see if we can cross them or see if we can simplify it out. So in this case, we got nickel 2, so Ni2 plus. And we have oxide, so oxygen and oxide, and oxygen come from the 16th column, which has a negative 2 charge. So in this case, this is also going back to what I said before, if we just crossed it, it's not going to work out great for us because if you crossed them, you'd end up with Ni2O2, but it can be simplified easier than that. We can factor a 2 out. You just look, it's a 1 to 1, so an NiO. Is that making sense with what I'm talking about with that? <coughs> Like I got the head and all that. All right. So here we've got lead four phosphide. So let's write it down. Lead PB four phosphide phosphorus. Phosphide comes from phosphorus, which is in the fifteenth column. So. Three negative. In this case, we will cross them. Three comes down there, four comes down there, so we get PB, three, P, four. And then on here, dead giveaway, if you got the name, there's not a charge here. You're not dealing with the D block dude, you're dealing with just those uh, ionic bonds. So we have calcium, so Ca2 plus, phosphide, which we just did, comes from phosphorus, 15th column, so the P, 3 minus, we're going to cross those over. So it'd be Ca. 3P2. Any questions there? Questions going once, twice.
Are you good? Do you just need these here? Yeah. No, that's fine. I'll leave that up. All right. Now, in this you've learned two sets of rules so far. Today you're going to learn the third one, and that's where these prefixes come into account at. I've given every one of you one of these prefixes, and it gives you the number and the name, the prefix that associates with it. Please listen to me carefully. I have a question. I want you to answer my question. Do you think Mr. Hall is going to let you have this on your quiz? Yes. <laughs> no! You're not getting this on your quiz? Y'all better than that. You must memorize. Well, it's really not that hard, is it? It's really not. A lot you know, of these you've already... Huh? Like, making a song for it. Like, you do that. I am not that creative, so you go right ahead and do that. That'll be awesome if you do. I'll post it. Do it. Please. Alright, but on this... It's not going to be hard. Some of these you guys have already used to, like tri, triangle, okay, uh, pent, pentagon, hexagon, octagon, heptagon. Ones that are confusing uh, is nine, nonagon. Like it's just they don't roll off good on my tongue. I'm probably mispronouncing it. But uh, then ten, decagon. All the prefixes there. De, non. Uh, oct, hep, hex. Go ahead. You'll pick it up as we go. Within this, this is when the prefixes are to be used. I can't stress this enough. This is only when you should use the prefixes. We've talked about the first type of bond. Ionic bonds. you got ionic bonds that deal with transition metals. And you also have ionic bonds that deal with s -walk. But, we have covalent bonds still left. Today, we're talking all about the covalent bonds. Now, please remember, how do you determine if you have a covalent bond? Awesome answer. Nobody knows. Hopefully this will make sense to you now. It's bonds formed from sharing of valence electrons. Sharing of valence electrons, yes, but what's the dead giveaway? The quantum group. Non-metal or non-metal. When a non-metal is bonded with a non-metal. <laughs> How do you determine whether you have a metal or a non-metal off the periodic table? Staircase. So we're talking everything to the right of the staircase now. Okay, strictly non-metal and non-metal. And this is the reason as to why these things can group up and pair in different ratios. Okay, you guys have heard of carbon dioxide at CO2. You've also heard of carbon monoxide, CO. So it's the same way. It's got carbon and oxygen in it, but the second one has an extra oxygen. So in this, we're going to roll through this, talk about this covalent bonds. This is the most important aspect in pop. When you are dealing with your covalent bonds, you will use the prefixes to show the proper number. For that element in that molecule. Okay? 
Now with this, there are some things to make sure that we get down to heart and down to memory. This is the golden rule, if I could ever give it to you when you're doing the nomenclatures of covalent bonds. The one thing that I know right now, I'm stressing the importance of it, and I have students sitting in this room right now that's going to miss out on this and going to make the mistake whenever it comes to naming. The first element. will always get a prefix. Except saying like carbon monoxide, CO. This right here, where it has a one. When the first element is only one, the first element Second Second element. First thing with the second element, always place the prefix, the proper prefix, before. And second, second with that second element, you're already used to this. Keep the base of the element name. Remove, removing ending to add 
I-D-E. So you're literally just doing what you're already used to doing. Now I will warn you, if you look on here on the prefix chart, and you see spots where they have parentheses and they got a vowel in there, that's pretty much in there because we don't want vowels back to back. Like, we don't call it, we don't call C-O as a perfect example of this, okay? First element, there's a one here, so do I put a prefix? No. So you just name the element, carbon. Second one, you're going to put the prefix of mon o. Then you're going to put, um, let's stop here. Should we do monoxide or monoxide? Monoxide. Monoxide. Okay, we don't do the double vowel. That's why you see those in parentheses like that. It's going to jump up there with another vowel, kick it out. So, you don't worry about the mono, you just do mon and then oxide. Make sense? Good? Yeah. All right, this is literally it. This is the third set of rules. So now we practice it. Here's a good example. We'll go from the formula to the name. I will tell you, going from the name, it's literally spelled out for you. There's, If you know the prefixes, you're guaranteed to get it. You're really trying to mess something up if you miss that. Okay, so N205, first thing we got, we have N, which is nitrogen. There's two here. Do we put a prefix? First element will always get a prefix, except when the first element is only one. Yes. So yeah. So what's the prefix? Di. Di. Name the first element, nitrogen. Go to the second element. We're we'll looking at the prefix. We got a five. So what's it for five? Yeah. Penta, you hesitated because I think you caught it. Because if we left it like this, we got oxygen, so it would be penta oxide. So it would be penta oxide. Penta oxide. <laughs> These are the ones that the kids love. All the students go nuts about. They're like, oh, we need to do more of them. Those are the easy ones. But these don't sound right. Like they sound weird. You'll, you'll pick it up. Like carbon monoxide, like I've heard of it, but that one. It's different. All right, go in into, oh, let's do this. Let's make it one for you. You guys give us a shot. You guys, please set your business down. I want you guys to give an opportunity to this. I feel like you guys will catch on this super quick.
walk me through this? Step one, do we need a prefix? Yes. Why do we need a prefix? Because it yeah, has a four. It has a four, not one, so it's that simple. What's the prefix? Tetra. Tetra. Phosphorus. Name the element, phosphorus. I misspelled that. No, well, close enough. Next. You would it's a tin, so you would go deck oxide. Deck wow, and oxide. Okay. Can't wait for my new grades to be on this quiz. <laughs> <laughs> so tetra phosphorus, deck oxide. I have a question though. Yep. You said that the highest grade you got on this was a D. And this is like so great. It's going to drop out now. I'll just, I'll be mad at this for like three days. But there's more. Somewhere. There is more. There's three more sets of naming rules. And there's a reason that I break here. And I did this last year when I broke here. And we quizzed here. This seems simple right now. But right now, you're doing the same thing time and time again. Because this is what I'll see a lot of kids do. You guys jump on this wagon so fast because it's so easy. You're like, oh, I just put a word there to represent the number, and then I put the element. And then you flip it because if I gave you something, let's say we flip it. If we did... Um, This is what I'm talking about. This is why everybody wants to jump to this. Disilicon. What's silicon? Silicon. So oh, <laughs> Di means what? Okay. So you put a two. Fluoride is what? F. Fluoride. Hex a is what? Six. So everybody wants to jump to that. They don't struggle here when they see it spelled out for them. They'll get that no problem. But this is when it becomes a problem. They want to take these rules and apply it to everything. And you can't do that. It all gets mixed together. When it all gets mixed together, it becomes a whole lot more complex. That's why on Monday, if we don't have to finish the lab, but Monday or Tuesday, we're going to work on practice problems. We're going to start applying these. That's what I want to do. I'm going to work these all mixed together. Because when we get to the last three naming rules, they're the hardest. And they become the most complex. So, I know how you're feeling. And I, I'm right there with you. That's why I'm saying don't let this fool you right now. Please. I don't, I'm not telling you to have fear. I'm telling you to give respect and work these. If you're not getting them, come to me early on. Because remember what you have next Friday is the quiz. Will that be like our first grade on the Yeah, it is. Yes, it will. I'm pretty sure it starts fresh. All right, uh, let me give you two to work. I'll give you two and let that be, that'll be about it. Guys, give me a carbon tetrabromide.
so bad. Like, All right, y'all give me carbon tetrabromide, chemical formula, and chemical formula for trisilicon pentoxide. Please, I'm stressing this to you. If you're not getting this, come see me during lunch. My hope and prayer is that you got those for carbon tetrabromide. You should have got CBr4 and for trisilicon pentoxide Si3O5. So you're really like, you are looking at the periodic table, but for those numbers you gave us the other day, like that goes to like one, two, three, those charges, they on these cobalt bonds mean nothing. Means nothing at all. Yeah, prefixes and elements. 